It is quite frequently that uh, I um, think that uh, that everything is is bad and 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 nothing seems uh, to be improving. That all the rational factors uh, tell us uh, that. Uh, there does not seem to be an an egress from from this situation um, in the nearest future. Uh, that uh, there are so many uh, apocalyptic um, scenarios and uh, forecasts, uh, and one should not be particularly um, a clairvoyant to uh, to see that there are too many factors which are against us or rallying against us. And then suddenly, something seems to change. Where is it coming from is not, is not uh, uh, clear. Then one could say that, all right, these were the, some factors and the forces that uh, combined uh, to act in a particular way. But at some point uh, where we feel that uh, everything is, is bad and where we feel that there is no place for hope, suddenly something changes. And it, uh, there have been cases in in the in the in the Russian history: the death of Nicholas the First, the death of Jugashvili, when it seemed that uh, that the no silver lining uh, exists uh, in these clouds. Um, it so seemed uh, in mid 1980s when there was this impression of hopelessness uh, and. It, the Soviet Union was uh, to uh, to stay there forever, but then uh, everything was uh, was uh, everything was everlasting until it stops, really, as one sociologist said. And so suddenly we we found ourselves in a different uh, um, dimension, uh, and in many ways this is still a an enigma to me uh, as to how this happens and um, lately i have been I, I'm, I'm i have lived with an impression that we are at the end of some very very big cycle um, which may have well started uh, in um, in 1989 in um, that we live uh, uh, in uh, and the uh, populism, the nationalism, what we see um, are manifestations of some big cycle coming to a close. And Ina told me about uh, this constitutional coup. Um, I was in Moscow, at the, and I'm a journalist. Uh, I've uh, written about uh, uh, about political processes uh, for many, many years uh, and social um, phenomena. And uh, this dramatic uh, moment uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Putin uh, is. Um, uh, dismissing the government and uh, calling up uh, a constitutional reform. And I, for some reason, I can't say that to myself that this is important, that this is, uh, uh, for some reason, I'm totally, uh, it seems totally irrelevant uh, to me. I talked to Kirill Rogov, then uh, my editor called from London and said, well, how is it? Is it turbulent in, in Moscow? I said, not at all. It seems to take, be taking place in the head of one person. Um, they are s seemingly solving something. Uh, uh, they are um, uh, making up little schemes, but it does not seem to have any relevance uh, 
with respect to the big historical cycle, and I may well expect that in some time we will say, all right, there was yet another thing that happened, just another uh, event in the series of events. I wrote Alexei Navalny that day asking if he would comment uh, what is uh, what was happening um, no and uh, alexei navalny is a is a uh, um, uh, very sensitive uh, politician um, who knows uh, when when uh, to speak or to comment and alexei navalny said no it's not interesting this is not something for me to comment uh, interestingly, uh, our opinions coincided on that day. And when I wrote uh, um, a book as to how we moved from Perestroika to today's uh, state, uh, there was a big uh, historical part in this book about the generation of the, of the 1960s or even 1950s those who eventually um, made uh, Perestroika happen. And I uh, read uh, the proceedings uh, of, uh, of Chernyaev's uh, 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 Chernya Chernyaev's, um, Gorbachev's aides, uh, diaries, uh, and his notes um, uh, from the Politburo meetings, meetings in 1987-1988, and this is remarkable reading. People are sitting at this Politburo um, uh, uh, table in Stare Ploshich, uh, um, uh, uh, CPSU Communist Party building in Moscow, and seem to be talking about very important things. They're taking decisions uh, without um, the slightest understanding uh, of the fact that their decisions do not seem to be relevant at all, that the life is uh, moving parallel or in history is uh, is moving in parallel, and they did not uh, feel what was happening um, behind uh, behind the window. They didn't understand that Chernobyl, Chernobyl is uh, is a disaster, a lot much larger, uh, and not just in the ecological sense, but also in so far as the system stability was concerned. Um, and it seems to me now that. Uh, um, now we understand what was uh, the role of Chernobyl disaster at the end of the Soviet era. So this um, feeling of the end of, the, of a historical cycle and uh, the seeming irrelevance of, um, of what the people in the Kremlin offices say and do um, uh, may be uh, is well alive in me. So that one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is uh, um, that's why I wanted to talk about uh, history. In 1989, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, Fukuyama wrote his uh, famous essay which he then uh, turned into a book about the end of history. Then he later on, he, he uh, disavowed his personal um, statement. He almost became a caricature. I'm not even sure if we have to uh, remind ourselves of the main idea, but the main idea was that there had been three ideologies, fascism, communism, and liberal democracy. Fascism was uh, defeated in 1945. Communism uh, was uh, fading away now, which was 1989. And so the history is coming to an end, and liberal democracy would reign. The ide ideological conflicts uh, have uh, cleared, and an interesting note in the end. Um, this, it may be that I have said all this right, but it seems to be, be a boring uh, rest of, of the human history. What are we going to be talking about? Probably talk about the last uh, models of cars or fridges, refrigerators. 
Then, when the history was back with vengeance, um, when we saw the revisionist um, passions in Russia and elsewhere, where we saw the and lived through this outbreak of nationalism and populism, and we all realized that, that the history is, uh, is, is going on, and Fukuyama was wrong. However, to me, um, the most important thing in his work was not so much the uh, uh, ideological component, but uh, uh, some uh, some definition, uh, the definition's uh, an interesting uh, point uh, that he was uh, writing about history as some sort of a successive continuous movement related to progress. The idea of progress, which was so vibrant in the age of reason in the 18th century and uh, started to move um, on and on. Uh, So these uh, social relations were um, uh, developing. So Fukuyama, I think, uh, gave uh, this uh, impression that this category of the future, category of the progress, was coming to an end. And uh, it seemed that we would uh, then continue to live in some sort of a postmodern um, world. Interestingly, now that we see the end of the important trends that evolved in the 1980s, and later on we can talk. And I suppose there is no roadmap. Nobody knows where to go next. And it would be really uh, very wrong for me if I should tell you, try to tell you where we are heading. I suppose this is something disappearing under our eyes. But interestingly, how history gets back makes a circle. Again, it seems to me that it's interesting to ponder Russia on, in a very global context, because history, everyone is concerned about history. Yesterday they celebrated 75 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz. In his new year address to the nation, uh, Vladimir Putin, who also has a very nice uh, feeling because he feels there's a need for uh, making sense of it all, who realizes the idiosyncrasy of Russia. Vladimir Putin, if you recall, he remember, he said the only event that he highlighted in his New Year presentation was 75 years anniversary of the victory. Uh, before that, uh, what seemed important, important talks on victory, uh, meeting with the leaders of the former Soviet republics, those are part of CIS, on the 20th of December, where the president of Russia laid down his vision of history, a very detailed and hour-long lecture that was illustrated with documents. It's clear that he, uh, this is his idée fixe, and this is not the only thing, this historic lecture of his. It seems to me what is great, what is great about it are several matters. It's clear that this is revisionism, politically orientated speech. It has to do with revising not only history, but the history that laid down as both part of the EU and its expansion to NATO in the early 1990s, as you probably, those of you who listened to this speech, read it, it there's a passage, it all starts with certain identification, very interesting identification with Germany, with Weimar Republic, and where the responsibility is laid with winners in World War I, where if you analyze the text, 
there's some affection even, some sympathetic attitude towards Germany that most actually they provoked her to start out the Second World War with the conditions of signing the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Well, there's sort of great for compassion that the president of the Russian Federation was discussing Germany that continues to pay out repatriation to the countries, reparations to the winning countries, how wrong it was to and arbitrarily the borders between the states were laid down, which further led to, to the crisis. And Czechoslovakia and Sudet, and attack on against Poland, on against countries that that were victors in the Second World War, and attack against Eastern Europe. Why I think it is important in why this speech, not only historically, not about history so much as it is, as it's undermining in many ways the very idea that was the foundation of the expansion of the EU when they would adopt both Poland and Czechoslovakia and other countries would be exceeding EU. The EU is the countries who were victims. I will discuss victims right now because the feeling of sacrifice, the topic of sacrifice and victims becomes very important. It's understandable that the state, Russia, and not is not alone, is very much concerned about historic memory and history paradoxically just in brackets, may I point out that the topic of the memory that seems to be omnipresent everywhere now, I suppose, PC is interesting. Now, daily memory, just common memory and historic memory, they all come into play here. And it's interesting that the states become the institutions, this oversight institution that seems to be in charge or it positions itself as the one that heads this transition of memory into history. Since the states are the ones responsible for the archives, the states are the ones responsible who appoint national holidays. So this process of memory turning into history, the state is now grasping it. And I believe right now we see very active political uh, use of history, which per se I think is highly symptomatic. It's clear that Russia is not the only country that is so much concerned about memory and its history. Putin, to some degree, was saying that he's responding to the resolution adopted by the European Parliament that lays down the way to treat history. Poland adopted, adopted a law, a law that said that you cannot mention collaboration, collaboration in Poland with Nazi Germany. And this rewriting of history, is working along this ideological lines that the end of the Cold War was wrong, was misinterpreted, uh, ended in the wrong outcome, because the countries that now exceeded the Western world, they were not victims. They were the ones to blame for the start of the war. Poland was to blame for the war because Poland too attacked Czechoslovakia. I don't want to retell the speech that Putin delivered. It seems to me that this is where we see a very important topic. All the speech by Putin is built upon this feeling of resentment and sacrifice that they're taking away the great victory from us. And it's clear that this discourse, historic discourse, the great victory and the Second World War are the only thing that legitimizes historic facts about modern Russia. That's the Soviet Union, uh, the main myth, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, that was excluded from all 
celebrations. 1991 brought about the democratic revolution that took part to place in August 1991 was not perceived in this way, in part, because from the very start, Yeltsin perfectly realized how difficult it would be to put it down. Uh, because, although the picture seems to have fitted, yes, Yeltsin stood on the tank, climbed on the tank, and aesthetically you could really, really lay down 1991 as the new page, as the onset of the new country. This was never done, in part because Russia was searching for its own place. In this long history, tried to bring it together. The most important word was in the 1980s. Normalcy was the most. We want to live very much like a normal country. What, whatever is this normal country stands for, was not very clear. But it was sure that two things were normal. It was what what it was like nine, before 1917, and normal are things that are in the West. The Commerçant Daily at that time. It was the first privately owned newspaper in this new Russia, came up with its own heading. This a caption that read that the newspaper was not published since 97, was it 1916 or 1917, I don't recall exactly, till 1991, for reasons beyond the control of the editors. So this time it could just be deleted from the Soviet period was just deleted and they tried to clue back with the pictures, mythical pictures of 1990-13, so to say, that was designated as uh, with this uh, old uh, spelling rules. And the word daily in English was put down in its name that showed that, well, the certain Western, New York, the New York Times, you name it. But Russia is, normal Russia is made up of these two, these two points, these two point of the two matters. In, the, in 1996, I don't want to recall it, I suppose after the election, Yeltsin uh, of the second campaign, I don't remember who at that time was his press secretary, who, but he was the person who claimed that the inauguration of President Yeltsin would be in line with the long-standing traditions of Russia. It was clear that there was no tradition of the presidents every place, but they will try to reproduce some sort of tradition that uh, that was highly important. Why am I saying it? 1991 never became a revolution, in a sense, the way we the way it became a revolution in October 1917. It never laid down something as an event that started a new country or epoch, something that would allow to Putin. I don't know when I say Putin. This is, of course, uh, not a person, uh, not today's president. It's some kind of uh, just collective image of this restoration system where they thought the next step needs to be taken. But we are really... Any glorious event can be put down in this discourse of a great country. So this war... And the victory in the war, it's clear that this is the most important event, and this is the only thing you could, um, the main ideological component, and we, I suppose, will see it happen in the very near future. What I think is really interesting here is the this dual, ambiguous component of the victory and the sacrifice. In essence, the history Free history, free historians tend to be corrected by the historians, but for the most part, history of the pre-Second World War was the history written by the winners. That was the history of victories. And the history was written down by those who would win, right? I don't know, battles or... I don't know, even Borodin, uh, that was point of fact uh, something that Russian army lost. It was something that would later on be interpreted as a victory in its own right, written down by the, those who won uh, over Napoleon. After 
Well, he had been philosopher bef shortly before his suicide. He was writing that history always identifies itself with the victories, and this is the. And some time or another, and the victims too may be writing down their own history, which in many part was the outcome of the Second World War. Uh, this is remarkably written down by both in Russian and in English uh, futurologist and historian Mikhail Yampolsky. I strongly urge you to read his articles. The history of the Holocaust was written down by the victims of Holocaust. And in the 1970s, sorry, in the 1980s, late in the 1980s, uh, a very interesting dispute broke out between two European historians on how to evaluate, how to assess how history should describe fascism. I may quote, no, I'm sorry, I won't be able to quote. Two historians, first historian's name was Sol Friedlander. They were deliberating on how you should describe history of the Holocaust. And the dispute was that Bossart was writing that it's important to treat Nazism as any other history. To realize one should understand its historic logic, that one should try to understand the context and uh, one should realize that the memory, given that the both historians were mostly in line with this main trend and in no way, even for a second, but both leftist historians would never ever would try to justify, even for a second consider justifying Nazism. But the question was that history and the memory of the Jews about the Holocaust excluded in point of fact this period at all from historic process. It seems to be, this memory seems to be myth. The logic, a uh, mythology. In simple terms, uh, as a result of this mythical perception of Nazism regime, we cannot discuss or draw parallels seriously between whatever consequent regimes and fascism. Fascism is just excluded as some kind of absolute evil, and Hitler doesn't belong to history as a historical figure. It's some kind of myth, figure of myth. Absolute evil, and there is nothing you can do about this. Any comparison would fail, would, because it would be incorrect. Lilander was saying that you cannot insert Nazi history back into historic logic because this normalizes then this evil and then this way seems to be diminishing the horrors and the tragedy of the Holocaust and the Second World War. This was highly important, as I said, because in this way some historic events, most important historic events of the 20th century, was considered to be beyond the frames of history, and in this way or other, became a myth. This turning it into a myth, if this word is to be correctly used here, this way would normalize, would make normal all other manifestations of the uh, same phenomenon. And on the other hand, it would cultivate the idea of uh, victims, <coughs> sacrifice. Further history should be linked together with uh, the defeat and the sacrifice. 
And it seems to me that the syndrome, first imperial syndrome that we see in Russia, seems to be superimposing over this very important topic. Because Russia is like a country that, in point of fact, uh, it's very hard to imagine it as a victim. It's a huge country with the largest number of nuclear warheads. It's a country that was among the vic those who gained victory in the Second World War, which in point of fact made it possible for back in the 1970s to start the convergence between the West and the Soviet Union. Those who were leaders of the country at that time were certainly a generation that belonged to those who gained a victory in inferiority complex. In point of fact, Russia doesn't seem to suit this victim, this image of the victim. Moreover, if we look at the sociology, and whatever was uttered about this of the early 1990s, this discourse about Russia being humiliated, it was non-existent then. The very time when economic collapse occurred, when we really had very difficult life, nobody really talked about rather than pretty... Uh, Sorry, marginal, marginalized figures at the time, nationalists and communists. But this is not the main discourse in media and in the culture that Russia is humiliated. Nobody much cared. Nobody considered like. So, for example, that the Soviet troops withdrew from Eastern Europe. Moreover, it's perceived to be as a positive thing, positive development. This agenda of humiliation rises or comes to the fore in the early 2000s, when it is exactly Putin comes to government, come to rule, and his estate, let me put it this way, or class of law enforcement officers or security officers who more than anybody else had good reasons to feel they were humiliated because they indeed were displaced and uh, were in the very, uh, very unbecoming situation in the 1990s. And this agenda, in many ways, was imposed, was superimposed, and was again projected to those years that the country lived through. I believe that this complex of humiliation that the West positioned Russia and put the Russia on its knees, this is something that at the time, but this cultivating this feeling of victim, victimization, was a very important part of this ideological structure of the revenge a uh, structure that Putin's regime tried to put into place. And what goes on right now, there is this paradoxical figure. On the one hand, yes, they seem to be cultivating that idea that Russia has become stronger, that finally, at last, Russia has is back, raised from its knees, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, we keep saying that, look, they're taking away from us the most important sacred thing there is, but this cult of the... I think it's as important as it is in Putin's ideology as the first component. Russia is not unique here. I think this is very important here to reflect upon it because the second side where we see although it maybe has a different wording here, but something very similar complex evolving, it's the United States. Actually, Russian-America parallels made the way they're linked, their ties, one could, the way they're reflecting, like a reflection of one another. It's highly interesting to consider it in this way. I recently traveled to Siberia and in Tomsk, where in other cities where 
Right now, in intellectual, among the intellectuals, the very topic of provincialism and uh, those patriots of their own America seem to be important to them. Russian America right now, this continues to be showing some kind of um, cohesion in this way that they are mutually reflecting. This is in point of fact what Trump does. Uh, he is undergoing this transition from the idea of a, being of exclusivity and some American mission that was the foundation that we are good guys, we are a good country, we are the ones who are, we are promoting our ideas towards ideals. They are moving away to isolationism. And most importantly, in what Trump says, he said somebody has been have been using us. Everyone is taking advantage of us, be it China, be it Europe, be it... If you look at Trump's presentations, they are very similar in their rhetoric in terms of what they cultivate, that somebody wants to take something away from America in trade balance, in trying to copycat the um, goods um, at a time that was something to be proud of, that they were very much like like a model. Nowadays, they're copying it very much like it is happening in business. When somebody is copying your product, they are really damaging your interests. It seems to me that this is very important. Indeed, this is a topic that is very important of cultivation as a victim that is related in some way that is tied to the history of the Second World War and the way it was written down. Another very important thing for me, which I can dedicate another five to seven minutes to that and that I'll suggest we would rather talk about this. Have a chat, Q and I. Cultivation of the memory. I Again, in the wonderful city of Tomsk, a muse there is a museum that is known as Professor's uh, Order, uh, flat. This is a lovely place. And uh, just in downtown Tomsk, this is a mansion of the 19th century that was restoring the interiors, not the original, authentic, but what that typical of the professor's family of 1870s or maybe 18, uh, 1900s. And uh, historical belongings, you enter into this flat and you're immersed in the atmosphere of the time of Professor of Tomsk University. You get this feeling that professor just went out some five minutes ago. He left this. But the only problem is there was no professor. This is a museum of a person who that never was around. Maybe people like this were there, but this is a museum of a museum. I suppose the generation trying to generate this memory, falling back on this memory, I suppose this is some of the most important topics for me that uh, has to do with the most important thing of the, in the political discourse here. And this has to do with, this memory has to do with with the idea that history is over and progress is over. Nobody has common idea for the future. The future has been like confiscated from nobody is thinking about what future would be like, good progressive future, what it would be like in a world. The topic of progress seems to be boiling down to technological progress only, which per se I think it's very funny because we see this time as it speeds up because it all is connected to technology, trying to 
bring about a new model of something. So the more you're searching for, the more you're producing and making new models, the more past you're generating. Because the next model of iPhone turns iPhone, five-year-old iPhone, into a museum piece which you need now to start collecting, to make collections, trying to build all kinds of museums of everyday life. I think it's highly important. And uh, that says there is no feeling of future, common future, social future, is non-existent. This ideology of Putin is built on along these lines. He never urges you to go anywhere. Nobody is building or drawing in this sense. Alexei Navalny, I don't know, ironically, but let's take it just as a text, like because the chief main topic of uh, Russia of the beautiful future sounds like almost like ironic because it's clear that this is some kind of mythology. Nobody is considering the future and but Putin's idea is pretty simple that the future is about the past. Yes. Good future is exactly the gold past, the Hudson age. And this is where I brought you. So this is, yes, there we arrived at our destination. This is the second most important topic that Trump has. Let's make, make America great again. But this is where we used to have this wonderful America. And the same can be discovered in this other countries such as Europe and I suppose Brexit in part and in many ways has to do with this topic of the golden health and age which I suppose it has to do with the idea of memory. Moreover, it seems to me that this generation uh, is trying to seek for, seek these novel technological models and progress in this generation of matters that are need to be done right now. It also has some economic aspect about it. And many people tend to, both the philosophers and economists of the recent years are now also contemplating this, that uh, the value is attributed, this value, added value, is created not through what is new, but how good it is, how old it is. This seems to be a, a bearing in importance. If you have want to have a good machine, you would a good car, you wanted to buy back in the 1940s, 1960s, 1950s, that was the newest make the newest mass-produced make of the car, something new nowadays. And the things which are of uh, value today uh, would be something laden with memory, with the spirit of antiquity. Uh, paintings of uh, young uh, artists uh, immediately go to the museum and uh, modifications uh, are all prone. Uh, the records um, mm, uh, in the past uh, five to seven years, the vinyl records, uh, so to speak, uh, yes, the vinyl records, which may be uh, more expensive than any CD, compact disc, not because it's better in sound, but because they are inscribed with this memory. So, but also the category of uh, aestheticism um, is uh, related uh, to to memory, as I said. What will it lead to? It may nobody knows um, because there is no this uh, sense of uh, of um, of what should arrive. And we are going back to restoring a history that um, Mr. Fukuyama so mistakenly foresaw. 
Uh, there is not much of a conclusion that I can make from um, the foregoing uh, presentation, but what I feel and what I see happening in Russia uh, today um, is important in this context of, of, uh, of memory and uh, an attempt to reinvent uh, Russia, to an attempt to, to bring back uh, the historical cycle. Mm, which uh, the cycle which may, um, in my opinion, started around 1989. And uh, indeed, uh, in the West uh, and in Russia at the same time, there was some idea of the future. Um, which was well alive in 1989. But I th one the, the last uh, uh, statement I would like to make is that the, the shifts which we're seeing in Russia today, and not just in Russia, but in this particular sense, Russia is very important to the world because uh, uh, because of this idea cent uh, centeredness, uh, because Russia is in a position to be generating uh, important meanings. So it seems to me that um, all these shifts and changes to the constitution or political changes, uh, they should be thought not only in the categories of a political uh, transformation but also in uh, cultural and anthropological categories. Because uh, those shifts which we are seeing in the society, in terms of self-organization, in terms of the change of the role of the state, in many practices which are totally new, um, these uh, changes may well not be political but anthropological. And if I may uh, just uh, say a few words about a book that I'm uh, taken away with, that I'm very much uh, impressed with, a book by a, uh, a great uh, uh, historian, a professor of uh, Oxford University, Andrei Zorin, who just published the book in, in Russian and is now willing to publish it in, in, in English. Uh, that's uh, a book about Lev, um, Lev Tolstoy, the Russian writer. This book uh, uh, is now being uh, printed in the third. Um, it, it, it is it's a, th a third uh, print run um, in a matter of several months, uh, and uh, I think that it is not only thanks uh, to Andrei Zorin's uh, knowledge, but also because of the of the uh, subject itself and uh, this uh, Tolstoy uh, and Tolstoy ideas and philosophy, which was uh, well mm, perceived as some eccentricism, uh, eccentricism. and Tolstoy's uh, spirituality uh, was uh, well viewed by many as the whim of a, of a great Russian writer and a count. However, um, Mr. Zorin is uh, writing uh, um, and probably giving a second life uh, uh, to our deliberations about Tolstoy and these ideas. Uh, the Liberty website has recently published a very interesting assortment uh, of materials which is called uh, Tolstoy is back. I think that, that this return of Tolstoy is yet another proof that the changes which we are seeing today are a lot uh, uh, more e extensive than what we thought about politics even 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, sorry for some confusion in my, in my presentation, but I think that it is important uh, and I may be somewhat, uh, um, I may be in, in just the process of, uh, of uh, fomenting some of the thoughts. And working for The Economist, writing for The Economist, I feel very clearly 
um, that uh, one of the major challenges uh, for us to face in the in the several years to come is to find a language uh, and maybe a uh, system of uh, of uh, um, describing processes.